I'd like to open with two verses uh, from different parts of the New Testament before I settle in on our main passage, which is the last chapter of Peter's last letter, 2 Peter chapter 3. But do we have those verses ready uh, to show from the Holman Christian Standard? 1 John 2, 28. Right, I'm not going to show that, just the first, uh, first John 2.28 and Revelation 22.20. 20. But that's fine, I'll just read these. I'll just read these. Lee does a great job back there, and I appreciate everything that he does. Well, look at that. That man is fast. <laughs> he wasn't in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, but it was close. 1 John 2.28, so now little children, and this is for you, uh, John, uh, Peter, Paul, all referred to the saints as their little children, remain in him, that is in Jesus, so, when he, so that when he appears, we may have boldness and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And the second verse is from the very end of Scripture, the last words of Jesus recorded in Scripture and the last confession of a Christian recorded in Scripture, Revelation 22, verse 20. And it says, he or Jesus who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. And then the response by John, Amen, come Lord Jesus. The title of this message are those last three words uh, spoken by John at the end of the Bible, come Lord Jesus. I want to bring you a message titled, come Lord Jesus. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and make your way to Second Peter uh, chapter 3, and while you're doing that, I'd like to start with a confession. When I was growing up, the Pentecostal Holiness Church taught five cardinal doctrines. Brother Bartz, do you remember that? Five cardinal doctrines? Uh, and uh, sis, I'm sure Sister Weaver remembers the five cardinal doctrines. And as a child, I was so naive uh, that I pulled for the St. Louis Cardinals, thinking that <laughs> they came on the radio every night, AM radio, and I'd listen to those Cardinals back in the late 60s and pull for those, and it became my favorite bird. And then I married a woman, as I told you last week, who absolutely loves Cardinals. Um, uh, we had five Cardinal doctrines. <clears throat> Salvation, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit, divine healing, and the second coming of Christ. Now, uh, those were taught and those were preached, and, uh, but the main way I learned them was by hearing the saints testify on Sunday night. And it would go something like this. Uh, someone would jump up and say, I, I thank God that I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he's healed my body, and, and, and I know he's coming back for us. And somebody else would jump up. Uh, and say, uh, bless God that he saved me, he sanctified me, he, he filled me with his precious Holy Ghost. And many times he's healed my body and I'm looking for his soon return. That's how it got down in my heart. Right? Other churches had catechisms. We had testifying saints. <laughs> it, it got in there anyway. Now what's my, what's my confession? My confession is that for years I could say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me and sanctifying me and, and, and filling me with your precious Holy Ghost. And thank you for many times you've healed my body, but I couldn't get that last one out. I believed in the second coming. I knew Jesus was coming back. 
And I was pretty convinced that it was closer than most people thought. And I knew that things were going to be better after he came. So why couldn't I say, thank God that he's coming back soon? How come I couldn't jump up and say, even so, come now, Lord Jesus? I heard many people do it. I couldn't do it. Why? Well, there was my Uncle Clarence. He was raised in church. I loved him. He loved me. But I knew that if Jesus came back today, Uncle Clarence would not go to heaven. Now, many of you have an Uncle Clarence, or you have an unsaved child, or you have unsaved friends. Am I right? Is there anybody that all your relatives and all your friends are saved? Because if not, you're not living right. right. You're supposed to be a witness, and you can't witness to everybody saved. All right? We've got to get out there and go, therefore, and make disciples. Am, am I the only one that has unsaved loved ones? I still have some. I still have some. All right? and, and I pray for them and I encourage them. And that includes, that includes friends as well. Now, I can give you this glad report uh, that about six years ago, my Uncle Clarence went into a, a uh, nursing home and a chaplain came by and he was gloriously saved. He watched Gaither videos night and day for the last three or four years of his life. He witnessed to everyone. You couldn't talk to him without him going, having tears in his eyes talking about what Jesus had done for him. And so when Uncle Clarence died, we had a glorious funeral. But there are others who weren't saved. So my problem is, how do I stand up and preach on the second coming and try to convince you to say, like John, come, Lord Jesus. Come right now, Lord Jesus. I wish you would come right now. How could I preach what I didn't believe, what I couldn't say myself? And you're looking at me now funny. Did I tell you this like a calf at a new gate? Y'all are looking at me funny. Where in the world is this preacher going? I want to show you how the Lord gave me victory and understanding in the third chapter of 2 Peter that set me free to be able to stand up and preach and testify and sometimes just shout, Maranatha! Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus is coming. Even so, come right now, Lord Jesus. I'd like to share that victory and the process with you today. What I would like to do, and I hope you found your way to 2 Peter 3, I would like to read, then teach a little bit, and then preach. I know some of y'all say, I can't tell when you're preaching or teaching. That's okay, I can't either. Uh, but we're going to call it reading and teaching and preaching. I want to start with verse 3. And I'm not going to interrupt much except for a few clarifying points. I would just like to read from verse 3 down through the middle of verse 15. Oh, good, we have that on the screen as well. Knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, I need to say it the way I believe Peter intended it. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, there were scoffers who, who were going to say, we've heard this all our lives. You preachers preach this all the time. He hadn't come yet, has he? Verse 5. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that was then existed perished, being flooded with water. 
but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Let me take those three verses and give them to you just a little simpler way. The word of God created the world. And we know that the, world is Je- the word is Jesus. The word created the world. And then when sin took the world over, the word flooded the world and destroyed the sinful ones. In fact, all but one man and his family and two of each creature. And then that same word has sustained the world uh, and all the people that are in it and will continue to to sustain it until there's coming another bigger final judgment. And as the old spiritual puts it, it won't be water but fire next time. And that same word that made the world, that flooded the world, that revived the world, is coming back to judge the world. And that word is Jesus. And next time, when he comes, when he comes next time, it's not going to be a flood. It's going to be a fire sweeping across the whole earth. And he goes on to tell us that then new heavens and new earth will come down. But look with me back at this text. But, beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the, wor- with the Lord one day is a thousand days, and a thousand days as one day. In other words, uh, time doesn't matter to God. God created time. Get your mind off the fact that it's been X number of years since this promise was made. Now, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, but the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore... And in Scripture, whenever you see that word, therefore, it's important. You need to look and see what it's there for. And what it means is, I've said all this up to this point in order to tell you this. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. That fact has been repeated now three times. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Now, I tell you, I'm looking forward to that. I don't want him to come Yet, because I've got unsaved loved ones, but I'm looking forward to a day when we don't have to watch the news and hang our heads, when we don't have to hear about parents killing their children, we don't have to hear about wars, we don't have to hear about drug addictions, we don't have to hear about crooked people in positions of authority. I'm looking forward to that time when righteousness will reign. Therefore, there it is again, beloved, Looking forward to these things. Looking forward to them. Be diligent to be found in him, by him, in peace. Now, now, there's a whole sermon there. If you can't watch the news and turn it off and still have peace, you need to quit watching the news. And then go pray through so that you can watch the news and not lose your peace. Without spot and blameless... Remember that reference in Paul to the bride of Christ at the end of time without spot or wrinkle or any such thing? And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation or means salvation. He is waiting so that as many as possible can hear the message and have the chance to give their hearts to him and make heaven their home and not hell. And I'm going to tell you about my breakthrough. It came one Sunday afternoon. 
We had just moved back from Mississippi. It's been about a little over 20 years ago. And we were attending a church, a wonderful church. I had great respect for the pastor. Uh, he also was a graduate of Emmanuel College, so we had that tie. And, uh, and at first, I didn't teach her anything. Um, and, and I got in there, and I said, I'm going to join the choir. I know it's hard for you to believe, but I joined the choir. They let me in the bass section. I had a section leader, and after a few services, he said, I found out what part you sing. And I said, what is it, brother? He said, you are our designated shouter. He said, you sing until you can't sing anymore and you just shout. And I said, well, that's just the way I roll. Uh, so I was a designated shouter. I got that nickname uh, in particular because of a Sunday night service after I had my breakthrough related to the second coming. Uh, my habit was, if I had service at night, choir practice, preaching, anything, on Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, about 4 o'clock, instead of eating supper, I like to have a cup of black coffee and an apple and sit down and read my Bible. Uh, that's something that I still love to do, a cup of coffee, black coffee, and an apple, and my Bible. I normally read my Bible early in the morning, but that Sunday afternoon time is a special time when he speaks to me very often. And what happened that Sunday afternoon, I was reading through the New Testament, and I got to Peter, 2 Peter, chapter 3. And as I began to read it, I found it fascinating, and I worked my way down. And, and remember, my problem was that I could say, thank God for saving me, thank God for sanctifying me, thank God for filling me with the Holy Ghost, thank God for healing my body. Um, and <laughs> but I couldn't get that last part, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. It wasn't just Uncle Clarence, but by that time we had children that weren't uh, serving the Lord, and we, you know, had friends at work that I loved so much that that had not confessed Jesus as their Savior, and, and so I just didn't know what to do. Everyone else in the choir had no trouble rejoicing when we sang about the King is coming or the Midnight Cry or any of those other wonderful Second Coming songs. Well, why couldn't I? You know, that was one time when I just didn't shout. I just kind of tried to hit the notes, uh, you know, and it's important to try to hit the notes, but you've got to do more in church than just hit the notes. It's got, you've got to hit the notes with your heart, not just your head. And uh, so here's what happened. I was sitting there reading, and I got to verse 15. Has this ever happened to you when the Word of God just lights up? The old King James word is, he quickens it to you. And I got to these words that say in the New King James, that's what I was reading, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is for salvation. And I love the implication there in the home and you see on the screen is as an opportunity for salvation. And then all of a sudden it hit me. The Lord is not going to come back until he is satisfied that everyone has had an opportunity to hear and make a decision. And then I began to say, wait a minute, didn't I just read? And I went back up to verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, that any should go to hell, that, but that all should come to repentance. And I thought, I need to read this section over and over. And I felt chains coming off of me. I felt burdens coming off of me. Because then I realized, I realized that I too could say, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come right now. Come tonight. Lord, come whenever you're ready. I trust you because now I understand that not one of my loved ones, not one of my friends, not one of those people out there who don't know you is going to go to hell because you came too quick, because we didn't do our job, because we were selfish in praying to get out of here. And I tell you, there are times when I've watched the news from the Vietnam War all the way up to today, I've watched the news and I have been tempted to say, get us out of here, Lord. First boatload, I want to go. I can't take it any longer. 
And how many of you know that sometimes things in the news might not be bad, but things in your personal life are all messed up? And it would be really easy to say, Lord, please take me now. I don't think I can face another day going back home. I don't think I can face another day at work. I don't think I can face another this or another that. But once we realize, because I thought it was selfish. I thought it was selfish to say, Lord, come get us right now. I don't care about all those people. I don't care about the people our missionaries are trying to reach. I don't care about my family members. I I don't care about the people in prison that we haven't reached out to. That's the way I felt. But then all of a sudden I realized I can trust him. He's not lazy. He's not slack. He is waiting until. He's waiting until the very moment when he knows all have had their opportunity. And those who would respond have responded. Now I'm going back. Now I'm going to wipe out this world and bring down the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness reigns. Now I'll come down and separate at judgment the sheep from the goats and the righteous will be rewarded and the sons of perdition will be sent into everlasting darkness. A little bit more. And then I saw that verse 11 and 12. And it literally... I, I've. I don't know if I had socks on, but if I had them on, it knocked them off. It was one of the most astounding things I've ever read in Scripture. Now, I've read it before. I probably read it a hundred times. But all of a sudden, I read these words. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God? My goodness. Look at that. It says right there that we, we're not only supposed to look forward to his coming, which I was guilty of not doing, right? I had to repent. And it was because I didn't trust him. I didn't understand his word. And I didn't trust him. Now, all of a sudden, he tells me that I bear the responsibility to hurry that day up. He said, I was raised to think that the Lord already had a super secret date written on a chalkboard somewhere behind the throne. And he wouldn't even let Jesus see it. Right? Because Jesus says, that's, I don't know, that's the Father's business. Right? Do any of you think that way? There's some kind of a date up there. Well, I'm sure the Lord knows when that date's going to happen because he knows everything. But this tells me that he's not as much interested in time as he's interested in souls. It tells me that he is coming back once we have done what we were supposed to do. This gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end shall come. We're having a mission service tonight. We're giving a a, a generous offering to missions, to support missionaries. Why are we doing that? so that the gospel can be preached. And the faster it's preached and the more effectively it's preached, uh, the better it's preached, the better jobs that local churches do in reaching their communities and reaching into the nursing homes and the hospitals and the jails and, yes, even the schools and in the gyms and the parks and the workplaces and wherever else you go. Uh, And being a witness in the way we live and the words that come out of our mouth in word and Indeed, the more we do that, that hastens the day of the Lord. It, if you don't know that word hastens, it means it speeds it up. It speeds it up. I remember a time when I was threatened with a, with a whipping if I kept doing something. And the intent of that threat was to get me to stop doing it. <laughs> Instead, I, I kept doing it. Because I didn't believe that a child this wonderful could actually be spanked. (laughs) And I remember my mother saying, uh, the faster you do that, the sooner you're whipping. (laughs) And so I started slowing down. (laughs) And then finally I quit it. And I missed that. I missed that spanking. Now, The faster we reach the lost, the sooner 
the Lord will decide that all have had an opportunity. The more we give to missions, the more we, we support local outreach, do local outreach in the community, the more people that you get to know and you tell them about the love of Jesus and you show them the love of Jesus and you let them know that there is something better. There's a victory they don't have. There's an answer they don't have. And that brings them to a point of questioning and brings them to a point of conviction so that you can lead them to the Lord or you can invite them to a good gospel preaching church where they can meet the Lord. The more we do that, the faster, the faster he's going to come back. I can't tell you when he's coming back, but I'm going to tell you that he knows and we have a hand in it. If you pick up the notes, you'll find that I only got halfway through the sermon. Oh, I'm not through yet. But so <laughs> the Lord put it on my heart to, to end it in a different way. That Sunday, I had that revelation. I'm a historian, some of you know. Taught history in college for 35 years, written books, church history in particular. And I began to review what I saw in here is that if you don't live under the shadow of the second coming, if you don't live looking forward to it, if you're not excited about it, if you're not saying, even so, come Lord Jesus, two things are going to diminish in your life. The first one is holiness. Remember that verse we read from 1 John? It says that we'll have boldness and not be ashamed when he comes back. And I began to review in church history that an emphasis on righteous living, godly living, I'm not just talking about, quote, holiness churches, I'm talking about all churches, the emphasis on godly living, on living a separated life from the things of this world, and yet we're witnessing in this world, that that diminishes when the second coming is not regularly preached and testified to and shouted about and sung to. As a historian, I noticed that. And then I noticed this, that when that, that awareness of the second coming diminishes, you also have a diminution of the effort, a decrease of the effort to go out and win the lost, sacrifice to send missionaries. We start, the people we're sending uh, at that point are primarily, and there's nothing wrong with this, uh, digging wells and building hospitals. But we're not sending soul winners into the dark places of South America or China or Africa or India or Europe. We're not, or the inner cities of Danville and Lynchburg and Roanoke and Greensboro and Durham. We're not doing that anymore. Why? Because the urgency that the Lord could come back at any moment, the urgency that the way we live and the way we witness has the ability to hasten the coming of the Lord. That those things start to die down too. And so you get churches where, where worldliness is more and more acceptable as a lifestyle and sacrificing to do outreach for salvation at home and abroad also begins to go into the back burner or maybe disappear all together. And you know what happened at that point? I'm sitting there smugly as a historian having my intellectual revelation. And then all of a sudden the Lord said, same thing's true of you. I went, what? What? And I began to think, when's the last time I preached on the second coming? Well, Lord, you know I'm just, you know, I'm just not too comfortable with preaching on that. And then I began to think, well, have you compromised in any ways in the things you do, the things you watch, the things you say, the things you live for? Well, yeah, Lord, you know, I'm just getting away from legalism. <laughs> we all got excuses. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I'm, I, wasn't out, I wasn't going out, you know, uh, smoking and drinking and 
Friday night, but I mean, I had made my compromise. And then the Lord says, well, how many people have you won to the Lord recently? How many people have you witnessed to? Uh, how many missionaries are you supporting each month? I said, well, the answer to that would be um, none and none. And then I had a time of repentance there. I didn't even finish my apple. I found it the next morning, brown. You know how you leave your apple out? Right? My, my cold cup, half a cup of black coffee was there cold the next morning. Right? I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I repent. I repent. I understand now. I must have the hope that you could come back at any moment. I must have the discipline that it brings in my life. I must have the direction and the passion and the purpose that it brings in my life. And so when I went to church uh, that Sunday night, we sang some song about the second coming. I can't remember what it is. But I didn't just sing the words. I just, I just rejoiced. I just rejoiced. Because I had an understanding. I had a breakthrough. The Holy Spirit had led me to the point where I could say, Come, Lord Jesus. And then when that song was starting to die down, I knew it was going to be good because we hit a key change and took it up a notch. You know, and at that point, everybody got to going. All right? <laughs> Amen. And, and you know what I did at that point? I jumped up in my chair. They put the bases on the back row, right in front of the baptistry, right? And uh, I got up on my chair, and at the top of my lungs, I don't know how many times, and I'm sure Gwen remembers this, I just yelled at the top of my lungs, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. And for 20 years, I've been still saying, that, come, Lord Jesus. I know, I know you're not going to leave anybody here. I know that who, who could have an opportunity. I know you've given me the responsibility. i got to live right. Uh, I got, right after that, we started supporting missionaries. <laughs> right? I don't know. There's over 60 churches that have been established since the uh, earthquake in Nepal that, that we've helped... Uh, put there. Now, I've never been to Nepal. I've never even seen a picture of them. But through the ministry of the missionary couple that we support, they have, they have established over 60 churches in the wake of that tragedy. And our money each month goes to support that. Right? Uh, and so, and, and there's a, a Bible school that we support, have supported in East Africa that the Sneeds operate, and, and they'll be there tonight if you get to go. And they train pastors in eight, eight East African nations. They have so far trained over 400 pastors who have gone out and planted churches. And we've had a part of that. And so when people get saved in Nepal because of those churches and people get saved in Africa because of those churches, we have helped hasten the coming of the Lord. And when somebody gives their heart to the Lord, and part of the reason is the conviction or the inspiration that your life brought to them, the way you've lived, the way you've offered to pray for them, the way you've stuck with them, the way you've witnessed to them. Uh, maybe you even brought them to church. When you do that, you are hastening the coming of the Lord. Now, I don't know whether I've, I've been preaching or teaching. I know I didn't follow my notes, so if you want to see the organized version that I spent days preparing... You take one of those and you will find it. But the bottom line that I want to share with you is this. You should look forward to the coming of the day of the Lord. And you should understand that your life, your decisions, your words, your giving, your worship, 
your witness and the work of Tree of Life Ministries here in the North Danville area, that all of this takes place under the shadow of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we are helping to bring on that great day. So at the same time that we say, come today, Lord Jesus, we then go out today and work and work and work as if it depends on our ministry. Amen? Do I have any... Uh, do I have anyone that would just say, I, I've struggled with this and this has helped me? Is there anybody who just, just encouraged the pastor by saying, this helped me? Okay, oh, good, I feel better. Yes, amen. As long as it's helped you. If, if I feel there's a need for an altar call, I certainly give it. But sometimes I believe the Holy Spirit drops it in the message. And I believe just by the act of saying, that's me, that was me, I've struggled with that. I've struggled with that. I've struggled with that. I think the best way to end this service is just say, is there anybody, and I hope we could have a few one at a time, who's willing just to have that same kind of breakthrough and stand up one at a time and just say right out loud in front of us, come, Lord Jesus. Is there anybody who will do that? Is there another? Oh, Lord Jesus. Whew, glory. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yes. Stand up, Susanna. Oh, <laughs> we got to help that Methodist girl out. <laughs> Amen. I feel like there's one more. Come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. This church, for all the things we say we're going to do and all the things we try to do, the most important thing we're trying to do is get people to heaven. <laughs> to, get people, to get people to shun hell and make it to heaven. That's the most single most important thing that we do. And, I, and, and the second thing is that, that we need to is we need to live the way Jesus wants us to live. And if I can take this message and put it in a nutshell, the nutshell is, if you don't have a, an earnest desire to see the Lord come back, if you're not obeying scripture that tells us over and over, look for the coming of the Lord. Anticipate. Be excited about if we don't do that, then those two things, soul winning, whether it's going out and witnessing one-on-one -on -one or giving money to missions, soul winning, and our desire to fight off the world. We're not trying to be, become cranks that, that look like we come from a different century. We're just trying to make sure that, that the things of the world are not the things we live for. The pleasures of the world the status of the world, the experiences of the world are not the things of the world, are not what we live for. If I, I wouldn't mind having granite countertops. I'm not sure what we have, for mica or something. We're in a rental. I wouldn't mind having that, but I know that I have a house that's going to have granite countertops. It's on the other side. <laughs> I might have them here, I might not. If I have them here, praise God. If I don't, it doesn't matter. Because whatever house I live in in this life is temporary, but that house is eternal. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> praise God. Praise God.